everyone, and thank you very much for this opportunity for our uh, contribution. And actually, this um, uh, was also a opportunity for me to look at other work and how they can be incorporated in my future work. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, basically, my chapter is very much on using statistics analysis, which is very simple and straightforward way of looking at demographic, at um, human development, um, employment, unemployment, and youth. And um, and I would like to compare this to the the, P, the the statistics, the data before and after the Arab Spring. Anything has changed since then? Of course, at the moment, at the time of uh, of writing, uh, we were in like 2004. Um, the latest data that we have is 2014. Um, probably what we expected is there's not much change then and of course uh, because of all this uh, not so much of a change uh, what does it imply um, to the people, the people expectations, so on and so forth and why am I interested in doing this comparison is because originally I'm from Singapore and Southeast Asia and um, it was interesting for me to see, I, I came from a city state I've never really seen this sort of uh, um, civil society participation until I moved to Europe and then and of course um, it was a very exciting period um, in a sense where a lot of things were going on, things that um, I have never experienced before uh, when I was growing up. So that was why I was very really interested in looking at um, in, in my web. So anyway, I don't have any presentation because it will be full of uh, statistics and then I will just uh, briefly go through with you what is the chapter and what I try to achieve. So basically in the demographics, um, they probably it's not something really new that uh, North Africa has a very youthful uh, population. And this youthful population now have gained more access to internet and they are more aware of the global affairs and they, they have more time to think about it and, and more educated and they were more vocal these days. And also, why I would like to focus on the youth, it's because of their role. At least it was perpetuated in the, in the media or in most of the reports, the role that they play in the Arab Spring. And uh, that was how uh, it was interesting, it would be interesting to look at the, 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 um, this uh, age segment of the population. So basically, um, across um, North African countries, the youth population represented between 38 to 50 percent, and that compared to some of the countries of similar development level, that was considered quite a, uh, quite youth, youthful. And of course, for a typical developed country, it would be 30 percent. And uh, when you have a very uh, bulk of youth in 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 the country and increasingly more educated of course their aspiration and uh, what they aspire to to do to be in future has also increased and this is something that in north africa the labor market and the job market and basically the economic um, uh, landscape have not kept up with that because most of the um, most of these youth, they were collecting a public sector jobs that secure that has uh, they give them some sort of security, their lifelong jobs, and so on and so forth. And the and um, and at that point or uh, before the Arab Spring, the public sector has contracted and the number of jobs were reducing and they were not in they are not creating enough jobs to absorb most of the young um, workers or the new entrants into the job market and at the same time um, the young workers or the new entrants they were not trained to i mean they were not trained with the kind of skills that the private sector was looking for and that actually perpetuated the, the unemployment, unemployment rate in, uh, in in North Africa, and precisely because of all this uh, of the un high unemployment rate of youth unemployment in North Africa, they actually provided a space 
to um, for these people to interact with one another and you know um, voicing out their discontent uh, on the uh, on the social media and people come together and you know um, organize protests or or some uh, or demonstrations and this is how what at least uh, the reports were uh, the re uh, what the reports were saying that that caused um, that actually leads up to the to, to the social uprising in um, in North Africa. So I have already touched upon the uh, unemployment rate and then why it has been uh, it has been always been a, a long term um, issue in North Africa. That was basically a, a slow growth in the public sector, as I mentioned earlier, and also the this is a result of the outdated uh, um, equity-oriented policies in the post-colonial period in the process of nation building, and the uh, and a lot of um, big spending and investment in education to modernize the economies, and also a blo uh, and also bloated public sector to provide jobs and uh, social security, and also such. Policy actually have become and proven unsustainable in the night uh, since 1970s, and uh, they, of course, um, these policies, even though it was it, uh, it was it was put in place um, in um, right after the independence, but that has actually shaped the attitude of the people in as a perception on you know correcting a working for a um, in a public sector. And and of course, um, even though um, the public sector has contracted, and um, and the youth or the new entrants, they um, they still continue to try to. I mean, if they could afford, they will continue to wait to uh, for a job available, and they will. And that actually, basic, okay, basically. There was this space where you know they, uh, it created a space again, a, a space for them to uh, you know not doing anything perhaps, and then and you know spending time talking to one another and talking to people and um, um, who shares the same predicament. And of course, um, the next issue is the unemployment rate. It also leads to a question of the labor force and the job market conditions, and this is of course lead to, uh, It was also related to the situation of a public sector contraction, because the job market was not generating enough uh, jobs to absorb the existing pool of unemployed workers and new entrants to bring down the, the unemployment rate significantly enough to feel the impact, and the youth continue to be more vulnerable um, to joblessness. Uh, than other age group, and um, basically the youth benefited very little from any job um, um, market uh, job market expansion. And of course, uh, the situation only got um, got worse after the Arab Spring. And next um, to the labor uh, labor market, looking into the little components of the labor market, the um, North African countries have. Uh, had done very well in terms of expanding the access uh, to education compared to a lot of other countries of a similar uh, development level. And um, so in some countries, correct me if I'm wrong, in some countries I think that it's, um, the education is actually free up to tertiary level. And um, sorry, and uh, so this is also reflected on the Numbers or I'm sorry, the enrollment rates in tertiary um, uh, tertiary institutions and secondary schools. However, most of most of the students or most of the youth, um, most of the youth and the students, they were not equipped with the with the right skills that would meet uh, that could meet the demand of the market, uh, of uh, of this uh, sorry the private sector. And uh, from our stat well, from the data that we have uh, we have got uh, in my study, is that uh, North African countries uh, concentrates uh, focus more on uh, social uh, social sciences and, and humanities studies um, instead in, uh, in, in instead in uh, mathematics and science 
which are this, uh, these are the two subjects that actually are becoming increasingly important to, to, to drive up the productivity and efficiency of the economic system. And also, um, and these two subjects actually uh, also helped uh, better prepare um, the people to adopt and create new te uh, technologies. So basically, uh, what uh, the, the data shows is that there is a skills mismatch um, uh, there's a skills mismatch in the labor market and uh, in the job market and the labor market. And so, this skills mismatch is actually an important issue because it actually makes um, not African countries um, less attractive to business with, uh, in terms of a private sector. And um, and precisely, this is the um, these are the private sectors actors that is needed to create more jobs to um, help ease the unemployment uh, in, in in these countries. So these are just like some of the very short summary of um, the, the data and the statistics that we have um, for this study. And again, um, back to my um, very first question: What have changed? Actually, nothing much has changed. And in fact. Um, the situation in, uh, uh, before Arab Spring looks to be better than after. And, and, uh, and logically, in this sense, we are comparing two countries, um, uh, Egypt and Tunisia, that have experienced a, um, the, the social upheavals and uh, comparing uh, them with um, Algeria and Morocco that um, were basically were doing very much the same as before. And in fact, after the Arab Spring, um, logically, Egypt and, and Tunisia was experiencing <coughs> some, some changes and adjustments that uh, which led to a situation that have not really improved or sometimes worsened. And I guess that that is uh, one of the message is that when people do not see any improvement of the change that they wanted, um, that they wanted, uh, they wanted to see, or when to, that is what they intend um, when they started this whole uprising, they got disappointed. And of course, when they look at on the other side, uh, their neighbors like, oh, okay, you know, they were very much, pretty much the same. They have the stability, and then. You know, perhaps the the, 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 the the older way it's better. So in short, um, this is one of the message um, of the study that uh, I would like to put up. And my the other's um, message is that um, I love using statistics. I like I love to I love to use data to to um, you know to find to, to find causations or to find some explanation. But however, I understand the peak four. Of, um, of using statistics. And of course, the statistics that I have been using for my analysis did not actually give me really um, satisfying, quite, I mean, it doesn't really satisfy um, the kind of um, answers that I was actually looking for. And um, of, however, this does not mean that uh, we should stop using it. I think that it would, uh, we should continue to use it. And then, of course, com uh, complement by other data like you know uh, the first two presenters that we have, and uh, how do we make use of these two types of data, putting them together, and help us to make a better prediction, and perhaps not prediction, but at least to help us in in making better uh, policies to ensure that you know uh, things still go. I mean um, that um, such disruptive um, um, events. Um, Will be will be mitigated. So that is it. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Pfeiffer, and uh, I got to do the economics chapter of this volume. And I'd like to thank Stephen King for inviting me in the first place, and uh, and Abbasalam uh, Matawi for the two of them putting together a really meaningful combination of work into which mine could fit. And I'm really grateful for that. So I've added something to the title here, The Lure of Authoritarianism versus The People's Drive for Democracy and Economic Justice. In other words, I don't think the Arab Spring 
is over. <laughs> and I think that it lives on in many ways. Let's make sure I'm sorry. Um, but one of the most important things that I want to point out is that uh, the Arab Spring uh, is part of, was part and is part of global Arab Spring-like movements. Um, look at the Occupy movement in the United States, for example. And they are, they fit into a pattern which is a resistance to neoliberalism. Neoliberalism as a set of economic policies, which I have been warning about since the 1990s, so <laughs> it's not a good way to be vindicated to see people <laughs> suffering. <laughs> um, the, uh, it, the, the essence of the relationship globally was really captured for me when uh, the state uh, employees, the public sector workers in Wisconsin were occupying the state house in 2011 and demonstrators from Tahrir sent them pizza because they were trapped in the state house, they didn't have access to food, a lot of people were sending them pizza. People from Egypt ordered pizza. Okay, so this is a global, global movement. And so the, the second aspect of that is that the Maghreb economies are strongly affected by anything that happens in the global economy. They're very well integrated. I mean, this region has never been isolated from Europe. It's always been part of an international system of trade, and that, that has not changed. So one can't look at just the Maghreb economies or any economies in, around the Mediterranean as individual units alone. You always have to look at a dialectical relationship between what's going on in the larger uh, economy into which they are fit, um, between that and what is going on in the domestic economy. Um, the demands of the Arab Spring protesters, of course, as, as uh, Waimun said, uh, were for jobs, economic opportunity on the one hand, and improving their own situations, uh, and also for an end to corruption, nepotism, political repression. So we have these two streams, the, the economic stream and the uh, political stream. And I focused on the economic stream in my work. And the, one of the things that really troubled me about the movements that we saw in many countries, and now we're seeing it in Algeria again and Sudan again, is that the, there are political demands that are very strong, still operating in the context where young people want jobs and opportunity and don't have it. But <coughs> there's no economic program to pull this together. We would like a democratic government, but we would also like social justice. How can we have a program that uh, would fit with both of these? No country has managed to achieve that. And while Tunisia struggles with its democratic transition and the various issues that we'll hear a lot about, I'm sure, later on, that are involved in that difficult transition, there is no economic program there or in any other country that really addresses the demands of the Arab Spring. I think this is, these are my two major points. That one is that you have to look at the global economy and how they fit, and secondly, the um, fact that there are no economic programs that work at this point. <coughs> So the, um, the global context that we have been operating in since 2010, since the Great Recession that fell out of the financial crisis led by the United States uh, from 2008, 2009, 2010, the global context has been one of uh, relative stagnation. Uh, for example, large uh, companies, the very wealthy people, um, including American corporations, uh, maybe led by American corporations, have vast savings that they are not investing. Uh, and there has been a kind of fragmentation of the global economy that the, the international financial institutions worry a lot about. They're really worried that economic nationalism, for example, led by the United States again, is going to, um, to be very damaging to the global economy. The countries that they expect to lead us out of this are what they call the emerging um, market and developing economies. Those are the EMDEs. The LIDs are the less um, 
industrialized economies. And so the, our mother countries are all considered EMDEs. Um, and the, uh, the problem uh, that they face is that they need you know, international flows of aid and investment. But the question is, is there enough of that? And the IFIs say, no, there's not enough of that. We have these savings being held by uh, wealthy people and investors that are not going into the productive uses. Um, but also, that the, uh, what investment comes in goes into certain kinds of activities that are not necessarily beneficial to the populations of the countries. They don't generate jobs. Uh, they don't transfer technology. They're not stimulating in a way that would be beneficial. Now, the Maghreb economies, in addition to being expected to be part of the leadership of saving the global economy, global capitalism, um, are also considered stepping stones into the rest of Africa. And um, the, Morocco plays a particular role in this. It's the most successful of them in terms of playing that role. Uh, the, and I've already reviewed the obstacles to the success of this global project. Um, so this is, a, I don't think I'm going to go through the, I'll just show you these. If you're really interested, you can read the chapter and you can look at these things in detail. Um, but one of the points of this graph is simply that the MENA countries are basically in the middle of the path in terms of growth. They're fit into the national and international economy in various ways and they play their role. If we look at the Maghreb countries as a group, one of the things we see um, is that their real GDP growth was slow to moderate after 2011. There's a real lag when you look at GDP per capita. Um, the, the growth rate is certainly not high enough to reduce unemployment and absorb new labor market entrance. Um, they face as a group low labor force participation rates and high unemployment as uh, I've said already. I'm not going to go into Country by country, I wouldn't have time for that unless Mark gets his papers mixed up enough here so that I can, <laughs> I can just go on and on. Um, but it is worth pointing out that um, the human development in these countries uh, experienced the biggest improvement in the world uh, between the 1960s and the 1980s. It's really remarkable. And Algeria went from a 10% a literacy rate in, in 1962 to 90% by uh, 2010. Really remarkable. Um, however, we have poor performance on the gender parity indexes. We're not surprised after what we heard this morning, um, except on the sub-indexes for, for females on health and education. Uh, there's been some improvement on the gender gap index and this is partly because of the quotas that some countries have set for female participation in the parliament. Um, oops, this is the GDP per capita. As you can see, it's pretty uh, not very high at, um, in the current year, and it tends to be very variable. Okay, so the Human Development Index is something I just want to talk about for a moment. As I said, there were significant improvements, and this was in the Arab world as a whole, and especially in the Maghreb, between 1980 and 2010. Look what happens after 2010. It slows down. The rate of improvement slows down. It stagnates. And this is a, a problem uh, because it means that the quality of the education system, the quality of the healthcare system, um, the uh, the quality of social services have all uh, not improved since uh, the uprisings took place, and this is a problem because governments have not been able to reorganize to have a meaningful economic program that's going to benefit people. the The most dramatic example of this was was a couple of months ago when the, those Tunisian premature babies died in the, in the intensive care unit um, because the Tunisian healthcare system has been on the decline since 2011. Now, is that the fault of the demonstrators? 
No, it's the fault of the government, because the government hasn't been able to pull its act together to improve the health system. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, oh, thank you. Okay, so economic status in the last few years, I haven't brought it up to 2018, too lazy to disorganize, I don't know. Um, they're still, all of these economies are still affected by the decline in the demand uh, for exports uh, from the EU. Uh, and reduced rates of foreign direct investment and of tourism. So these are still problems, uh, a spillover, if you will, from the financial and crisis and the Great Recession and the stagnation in the global economy. They're still dependent on development aid and remittances. You can look at the stats if you wish. It's all in there. Um, Mauritania's growth tends to be very volatile. Uh, because of its dependence on raw material exports. As the price of iron ore goes up and down, the Mauritanian economy goes up and down with it. Algeria and Libya still suffer from, um, from the volatility of the hydrocarbon markets. When, and they, they both suffer from Dutch disease. And Dutch disease, <coughs> if you're familiar with this concept, is when, when oil or hydrocarbon prices in general are high, <coughs> then it's easier to just pay for imports than it is to have the foreign exchanges pay for imports instead of investing in your own domestic economy, manufacturing, agriculture, services. What happens when the prices fall? Uh-oh. Right? You can't afford, you know, not getting the foreign exchange, you can't afford to purchase those imports. Domestic uh, production has suffered and you can't replace it because you haven't been investing in it. And this was a very uh, serious problem. It remains such for Algeria, of course. Libya is a little hard to tell at the moment. But one thing that I think is worth saying about Libya is that between 2005 and 2010, it actually had a serious opening to um, trying to in, in change the balance in the domestic economy and even to bring in foreign capital that was not just going into hydrocarbons. Um, Tunisia has suffered, of course, from the ongoing conflict over the direction of the economy. Um, Morocco has seen increased foreign direct investment. It's done the best of all of these uh, economies in terms of that. But most of the new investment is going into production, manufactured, manufactured exports, yes, but it's going into production of automobiles, for example, electronic parts, um, parts for airplanes. And most of the inputs are imported, and they have to be paid for, of course, where the exports bring in foreign exchange. But the balance between them seems to be perpetually that the country is in a balance of payments or a current account deficit. So it's great that you know the, the World Bank and the IMF say, oh, this is terrific. They have all these manufactured exports. They're a successful you know, neoliberal uh, economy sure. doing what we said. OK, thanks. Um, however, uh, when you look at the actual stats, what you see is that uh, this, the current account deficit continues perpetually. And that means more debt, more borrowing. And Morocco's debt remains more than 60% of GDP year after year after year. This is the investment attractiveness scores. Arab world in general doesn't do great by world standards. Morocco is the best. All right, so the, um, I'm going to just show you. This, these are North Africa pipelines. It shows you the dependence of Algeria and Libya on being able to export that oil. And I just want to show you my pictures. And then Mark can kick me off the stage here. Um, <laughs> So the pictures are all of protests because the Arab Spring is not over. So these, this is a protest that took place um, in July, and uh, in July, I'm sorry, 2018, and it was anticipated, the protests that were coming up uh, that we've seen recently. And so this took place in Wakla, I mean, of all places, right, way in the countryside, a place where it has been uh, neglected for decades, marginalized, excluded. Um, sounds familiar, right? This is one of the major issues for Tunisia, is the, the uh, denial of resources to the, uh, to the rural areas. 
Uh, this is, these are the students taking part in the protest in Algeria. This would be a better way of having an energy integration with Europe if we had all uh, um, solar and wind and other kinds of alternative power. Mm -hmm. um, oh, dem demonstrations in Libya last August. What for? Elections and improved public services. Wait, I thought they were in the middle of a civil war. Well, they are, but that doesn't mean people can't organize a demonstration and ask for what they need. In Mauritania, the issue is slavery, and here is a former slave who's running for office in Mauritania. I like, I like that. Female. Um, Morocco, people in the, uh, in the Reef region are out there demonstrating because they've been neglected too. These are all recent. And Tunisia, of course, why are people protesting there? Because they haven't gotten what they need out of, out of the uh, changes or lack of changes since 2011. So the conclusion here is protests go on in all five countries. The demands of the Arab Spring are not yet met. And it, this is now complicated by the lure of authoritarianism, apparently even in Tunisia. Thank you.